about that and what you can do about it. So, when you have small sample size, these problems are much more likely. Your model is too complicated for to estimate accurately with your small sample. If you got this perfect mental model, but it doesn't actually fit the data, it's misspecified to try and represent the, the S covariance, it won't work. If you've got more, if you said, well, this is different to this, and that's different to this, and you have a model with lots of factors where you think there are differences, but the real world doesn't believe you, doesn't think like you, then you've got too many factors. It will fail. <clears throat> All solutions must fit and capital and be theoretically sound. If you can't explain it, if it doesn't make sense in literature, if there's no theory or empirical reason to believe that this is correct, then I don't care if it fits. Chasing fit comes second to your theory. What some of the solutions are, well, just take away a factor, join things together. Sometimes it's the item that's the problem. And there's a tool in all factor analysis, confirmatory factor analysis, that uses, provides you information in the back to say, well, while you were looking at this, we went behind the scenes and we tried every possible extra regression and correlation, and here's what we think would improve your fit. And that's what modification indices are. It's basically machine data mining to find paths that you didn't think of that would make it better. And in addition, even if you make an adjustment, your improved solution may still not be right. You still should test it against logical alternatives. And then we're going to talk about, but does it work for everybody questions. That's called invariance where you say, well, I've got first group, and then I went and got a second group. Does it really work the same for both groups? Or in my group, I have boys and girls. Does it work the same for boys and girls? Because it might work for one group, but not the other group, in which case your model is not universal. Once we've got all of this done, then we can say, so what can we learn now? What does this model tell us about the humans who gave us the data, right? Because in my world, this is the question, is the point for doing the research. So what can we learn from this data? There are multiple causes of inadmissibility. Lots of things make solutions break. Psychometrica, oh, we are not worthy. So, Gerving and Anderson, when you say there's a sub-factor, like a hierarchical model, when people that you're using don't make the same fine-grained distinctions, they don't think like you do, so they don't answer the way you would. Very good paper by, here's Mr. Bolin again, Professor Bolin, we're not worried. This guy Curran is very good too, Patrick Curran in factor analysis and structural equation modeling. If you see anything by Bolin and Curran, pay attention. They know what they're doing. And as I've mentioned before, not having enough items to recover the factor will cause the model to break. Not having enough people, too much missing data. Um, let me share a little story. 2008, I got invited to Hong Kong because my colleagues there had used, had translated and used my questionnaire. And they administered and they said, can you help us analyze the data? Sure, I'll come, no problem. And they said, uh, it's, uh, we have over 400 cases. Oh, excellent. So I had assumed that they had done the data preparation. I just assumed they knew what they were doing. 
They are education researchers in curriculum and instruction. They must know what they're doing, right? They wouldn't do a survey without checking before giving it to me. So I <clears throat> ran it against my model, and really weird numbers came out. And I looked at it, and I, I don't believe this. This must be wrong. So I went back in and looked at the data and looked at the missing. And in fact, sure, they had 400 and something people, but only 288 had turned over the page to the second side and filled in the second half of the questionnaire. So they were protesting, you know. Yes, okay, uh, you're making me do this. It looks like I've done it, but I'm not really doing it. But 288, and I said, well, wait a minute. We can't use people with 50% data, data missing. The machine solved it, but the numbers were really weird. So I took away the 150 people that hadn't filled out both sides, and suddenly the model behaved in a sensible fashion compared to what I had found in New Zealand and Australia. So, and that's the model we got published in 2009. So, just because you can estimate the missing data, and the machine will estimate it, doesn't necessarily mean you'll get a sensible, believable, plausible, defensible solution. Negative error variance. This is when your solution explains more than 100%. Often known as a Haywood case after the professor who identified this phenomenon, probably in the 1920s. When the minimum of the discrepancy function is obtained with one or more negative values as estimates. Okay. So, remember what happens here. So here's our number line. Here's zero. And sometimes you get a value that's here. This is negative, this is positive. And say it's negative 0.03. It's small, but it's negative. What do we do? Well, every point has a confidence interval, right? The low and the high, 95% confidence interval. If the confidence interval goes past zero, what is the true value, negative or positive? You can't be sure. It could be positive, it could be negative. But because the confidence interval goes over zero into positive territory, that gives you a reason to say, I don't know how big it is, but I know that it's actually greater than zero, so I'm going to set it to a very small but positive number to stop this negative error variance. And the research, the recommendations, especially from Chen, Bolin, and Co., say, do this if the 95% confidence, 95 confidence interval crosses zero. And there is evidence from previous studies with other samples that the number is not negative. So to say this is really not negative is just a chance effect, you need to know that it could be positive, and in other studies with the same instrument, the same variable is positive. If you have those two, most people will say, okay, I don't like it, but I understand why this happened, and you fixed it appropriately. You didn't give it a big positive number. Give it a little but positive numbers, so the solution is now admissible. Okay? And it's all because we understand the principles of a confidence interval. The 95% confidence interval tells us that we're 95% sure the true value is in this range. Which value is true, we don't know, but we know it's between here and here. And one of those numbers is bigger than zero. So we're going to use that number. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It often happens 
when you've got a model that worked with 500 people, but this study only has 80 people. It goes, it just, blech. Because the original estimate was so close to zero, but positive in the big study, when you get a small group, it might just cross over the other way. Because if the true value in previous studies was here, say 0 0.10, and the confidence interval high, low, went below zero, then it's possible the next time it will come out as below zero. It's just the way confidence intervals work. So if the previous study was positive but low and potentially cross zero, it's not a surprise that with a smaller set you might get a number below zero by chance because it's within the possibility of chance, right? At least 5% of the time we're going to find a statistically significant result by chance. Any questions? Is this confusing or is this, oh yeah, shit, he's boring us because we know this. So when you get to the negative error variance, is it, could it be positive, you do this, so if it's minus 10, but the standard, the standard error is 0.06, 2 times 0.06 is 0.02, so you know it could be positive. So you set it to a small positive. That's, that's from these guys. Okay, that's what they told me. And I went, yay, I can fix it. All right? And what is not? What if it's not? Then you know your model's wrong. At least with this sample. Uh, sometimes you can't fix it this way because it's minus 20 and the standard error is 6 and you're stuck below 0. You know there's something seriously wrong with your model. Your model is wrong for that data set. One trick Say you've been doing a series of survey studies, and each one is kind of small. This one's only got 120, and the next one's got 80, the next one's got 57. And you try to analyze them separately, you might get this unfixable. But if it's the same inventory, put it all together, and suddenly you've gone from 120 to 250, and you'll get a better estimate. And then maybe you could do an invariance test because then you're giving the machine power to estimate more accurately. So either your model is wrong or by chance it's wrong and you could fix it to point a positive number or you could say, well, if I add this group to another group that's done the same instrument, maybe it'll stop being negative. So this is how Amos reports it. And AMOS will show you, here it is, minus 0.19, but the standard error is 12. 12 times 12 is 24, that's bigger than 19. And it shows you the p-value. The p is 0.108, which means it's possibly not ne negative. It possibly crosses zero. These ones do not cross zero. Okay, you can see. Estimate, standard error, critical ratio. There is no way this will cross zero except maybe at the 2,000% confidence <laughs> interval, which is stupid. We can't go over 100%, right? Even if politicians say they're 110% behind us, right? And so these ones cannot be zero, but this one could be zero or it could be positive. We know we don't know. Right? That's the power of a confidence interval. And why on Monday I talked about that. Because you're going to need it. <clears throat> so, here's a situation where this was negative. I fixed it to 0.005 and it stopped being a problem. But notice, 
When you set it to 0 0.005, the estimate here is now 1, because that's a rounding of 0.995, right? So you've said almost every, all the variance must be on this path. And this is, basically it says 100% of the variance is here. Which is probably not true. And we fix this here, and suddenly this is okay too. But when you see 1.67, you know, maybe this is wrong. Yes, it solves, but maybe it's wrong, right? So just because a model solves doesn't mean it's right. It just means it's admissible, it's legal, but it's not necessarily a good. And you kind of look at this and go, uh, you know, 40, 50, 20, 30, I believe these numbers, but 110 and 167, it's possible with a regression, but maybe it's artificial because of how I fix these negative error variances. Maybe I just had too many factors to start with, and that's why it created that. So you can fix it, but you might not solve it, right? You may not, you may look at your model and go, oh, I don't really believe this. And these numbers um, on the green um, are the ones they're standardized regression weights. They're the beta values. So what this is saying is this path for one standard deviation increase here, you get 1.67 standard deviations increase there. It's technically possible, but I'm not sure it's right. So I want to go back and play with my model until I get a number smaller than one because I don't believe in perfect causation. And I don't believe that one unit change here will cause almost two unit changes here. And that might be wrong. If it's too good to be true, it's probably not true. Right? Be doubtful. So, Here's a negative error variance, that famous E67. At the same time, there was a correlation of almost perfectly one. When two things are correlated over 0.90, how many do you need? One. When two scores are perfectly correlated, you only really need one score, they're duplicates. So this suggests to me, maybe these two things are actually one thing, not two things. In their minds, not in my mind, but in their minds, they're the ones I'm trying to study. I'm trying to understand them, not me. And at the same time, partly because of this, it says the covariance matrix is not positive definite. In other words, we can't find one perfect, one solution for this. Something seriously wrong. And when you look at the correlation, because I understand correlations more easily than covariances, I can begin to see, ah, I need to think about this relationship. And maybe if I fix this bigger problem, this little problem might go away without having to fix it. Right? This is always should be seen as second priority compared to this. Covariance matrix, not positive definite, is a much more serious problem than negative error variance. And they can interact with each other, one cause the other. And this one, in my mind, suggests much more strongly this is the nature of the problem. I've I've said these two things are separate when not according to my participants. They think of them as one. <clears throat> because, remember, the fundamental goal of factor analysis techniques is to represent, more simply, the complexity of reality. And the reality is the data you got brought in. So, 
One of the things I do when I start playing with solutions that don't work is I have a mental model, so I want to try and keep my mental model. I want to test my mental model to destruction. You know, you build a car and you give it to a safety organization and they try to break it. Would, would drivers die in an accident in this car? And the engineers are going, of course they won't, but we test it. So I might have a theoretical framework, so I should try to protect this theoretical framework rather than just throw everything in the air and see where the data lands. There's too much chance in that process, as we saw two days ago with exploratory factor analysis. So here's a situation by reducing the number of factors. So this is my student conceptions of assessment, and I had this factor loading on one, two, three factors, and it's not clean, it's not simple structure, because this factor is explained by two factors, and so, and this factor had negative error variance. Sorry, this factor here had negative error variance. So I solved it by keeping everything the same and getting rid of the sub-factor because from the perspective of the audience, that extra sub-factor was over-explained. Here's another solution. Remember you just saw 0.995 between here and here? So instead of going cancel and move the items, what I did was change a correlation into a regression. These two are almost identical, so this belongs to that. And that changes the model from inadmissible to admissible. Doesn't make it a good solution, it just makes it a legal solution. Okay? So, when these are so highly correlated, and now this error will let you see if you've explained more than 100%, because now there's a visible residual that might go below zero. Here, you, there's no residual in the model, but if they're so highly correlated, they're either one thing or one belongs to the other. So I chose to keep this group because these items had good fit to that factor. I just had the wrong structure of how the two factors related to each other. And going from correlated to dependent made the model legal. Okay? The number is going to be the same. How do we, uh, what is the difference in interpretation between correlation and regression in the model? In correlation, uh, I mean from the meaningful. Sure. <coughs> in a correlation, two things exist simultaneously. No, no, I understand. In, in this model, I mean. Sure. You say that, for example, I suppose that um, improvement and nurturance uh, just exist simultaneously and influence each other. In this one, I'm saying nurturance is an indicator characteristic of improvement. It's just interpreting what a correlation means compared to what a regression means. In this case, I'm saying nurturance is an identifiable factor. It's an identifiable factor. But here, nurturance is belongs to, is explained by the idea of improvement. So improvement now is a oh, like higher... Uh, becomes a higher order relationship. Mm -hmm. And how did you choose the direction? So yes, why not? Could it be on conceptual grounds. Okay. Because this was data collected in China, and I would go and talk to my Chinese colleagues and say, you helped me write these items, right? You, know, you guys know what you're talking about. How do you see that in relationship to this? And they go, oh, if you care about your children, you care about your students, you want them to improve, and you care about them. 
So improving them means you have you care about them. The Chinese have an expression which I only know in English, which says, teacher for a day, father for life. Of course, in the days when teachers were men. But, so <clears throat> it really means that a teacher who's trying to make you better is also like your parent who cares for you. And that is actually a very ancient, it's in the journey to the West, which is over a thousand years old. So <laughs> this expression has been around it probably comes from Confucian theory because superiors had responsibilities for subordinates um, in first classical Confucianism. So this idea that improvement meant not only making you learn more but also caring for you seemed a logical interpretation in that context, in that society. And you understood that you need this change because uh, residuals were highly correlated for these no, two factors. No, not the residuals, because the factors were so correlated factors, okay. that the covariance matrix of these factors was not positive definite. Uh -huh. So, by doing this, I take away that problematic relationship. This is no longer part of the covariance matrix, the correlations. This is now a dependent, subordinate factor like this one and this one. So I'm creating a hierarchical model out of it. Yes, sir? Can we change the direction of this regression and check loss of sun and see which one is it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because this direction can be canceled, go this way. But, and you could look at the fit. And it may be stronger this way, but if I can't explain it, it's a worse solution. So I picked a solution that I could explain, even if it's just a speculation. You know, so that's why it's so important to know the contexts and theories and cultures of the people you're working with. I don't want researchers to become psychometricians. I want researchers to be able to use psychometric tools and theory thinking. But you have to still know your content. You have to know what is this culture like? What are these people like? What is, how is this done in the environment? What is the policy and what is the practice? What is the history and traditions that influence my participants? And if you can't, if you don't know that and all it is is numbers, You're a statistician, number cruncher, but you're not a researcher. A researcher has to know, what do these numbers mean? Otherwise, the numbers don't know where they came from. And someone has to know where the numbers come from and what they mean. And that better be you if you're writing on a research article or a thesis. You have to know. Everyone else can just go, oh, okay, that's number five. Wait, what did you learn? What's the so what? Here's another problem. I only had 82 people in this study. Not desirable. And this was inadmissible. 1.44 means that this error variance was less than one. Uh, 1.40 correlation. You cannot have 1.4 as a correlation. So this is inadmissible. And it's probably because it's just too few people compared to, what was it, 27 items and 82 people? So come on, who's not surprised? And down here, 1.15, 1.20, 1.63, like, ah! The model is not true for this small sample. So I simplified the model. Three ideas. So all of these ones go to here. These ones go to here. These ones go to here. So I'm keeping the big picture and losing the details. And this was correct. 40, 80, 80, all the numbers are okay. 
and no longer is it inadmissible, it's actually admissible, simply because I took away the over-specification. But this worked with 500 people, that was my PhD. 525 teachers, got a model, yay, works. Give it to 82 and it doesn't work. Why? Because small n breaks things. It's hard to find factors of only three items with 82 people. But factors, how many is this? This is, this is the smallest one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six factors in a three-factor solution with 82 people.